I am unashamed. What about you? Welcome back to Unashamed. We uh, yesterday, Jace, I was I had the, some friends in town, and um, they came out and visited a little bit, and then went back to Oklahoma, um, Pete and Zadana, and so I took them up to Duck Command. We didn't really have enough time before they had to catch their flight to do the whole tour, but I was just kind of showing them around, you know, Duck Commander. And so I went into the offices of Tread Lively, which is the company that produces all our podcasts that, that Zach runs. And uh, I noticed as I'm walking down the hall, the, the offices of people that work in production, they're like little dark caves. They're all, yeah. it's not lit up, it's all dark. And, it's like, and you see like a glowing face in the background. And it's, and it's almost looks like you're afraid to walk in. It's like there's mold. It's, it's really not, but I mean, it looks like it would be a damp, dark place. That as I was looking at all the offices, it's not you know. It's usually go to an they, office. They prefer an office without a window. Yeah, no they window. Say, yeah, no light. All the very dim lighting. So I quit my first job because it didn't have a window. Yeah, you could never work for Zach. For you could never work no. for Trad Lab. It, it would never. Because you'd be like a little troll. In a, I'm in really a glad we're right in the moment of Jesus on the cross because people who would force people to work <laughs> without a window. <laughs> the only way I was I waiting can, for someone, Jay, to come by with like a pot of gruel, like to give them their lunch, you know, in their little caves, you know. To, to as an outdoor them. enthusiast, I just, <laughs> it just, it would be a torture chamber for me. It really would. Zach, did you, were you aware that the working conditions of your staff and people, all your production people, did you know? I mean, that was just my observation. I'd never been to the offices before. That was my first time. Well, they have, they have field trips. You know, Maddie gets to do a field trip twice a week. Come, come out. You let her out into the she, sun to come out here. She gets out. She probably wears, wears sunglasses, you know, make sure <laughs> it's not too bright outside. But, um, yeah, I mean, look, I, we had offices with, with windows, and everybody was like, no, it's got to be dark, covered up. It's part of the, you know. Well, they've all got about. headphones on because they're editing yeah. all our podcasts we do. So, And they're, they're also just silent. Like, it was just such an odd. I've never been. I guess it's that way for production companies ever. But it was just like no one's talking. Everybody's listening in a dark place. I don't know yeah. what that is. I just it didn't look like a place. What stood out for them in that story is why. You know, I should have had my guests who I took duck hunting. They didn't. They didn't wear face paint, and you know, the blind looks like a little dark cave. Yep. And those ducks would get over us, and you know, they they were seeing they were seeing something. I know what they were seeing. They were seeing those faces shining uh-huh. in the blind. I was gonna well, rag were them. They against them, face paint about or? their shooting, but look, do we have permission to be real here? Look, I've never spent. A day duck hunting, where I'm going to describe to you what my day was like. When the ducks came in, I would look to my left and look at the duck, look at my left, look, and I'd, boom, I'd shoot. I look back to my left. I, they were making me nervous because it was just a hail of gunfire. And some of the places where you could see where their patterns were hitting were nowhere near the ducks. That's why I kept trying to. See what they were shooting, yeah. But but I look, would look in the air. I said, There's nothing there. There's nothing that's flying toward them. There's nothing flying away from them for the most part. <laughs> but I keep hearing. Woo, 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 woo. And well, here's the funniest thing that happened. So, the first duck that came in just came in beautiful, backpedaling, backpedaling. Lights at the front of the decoy. We only had eight decoys out. And six of them were moving. And so the first shot that went off, the the duck lit on the front end toward the blind in front of the front decoy. The first shot that went off was at the back decoy that was moving. (laughs) And I said, look, I was going to get... Now it's it's coming (laughs) The duck got a... And and one of them shot him, one of the the new guys. So, whoa. But I said, so one decoy and one duck. No, shot. no. Here was the funny part, <laughs> and I said, I think someone shot a decoy, and Shane E said that was me, <laughs> and I said, I'm not mad, and he said, I appreciate it, brother. I said, No, I'm not mad because we're brothers. 
I'm I'm not mad because you missed it. <laughs> he he shot out at the decoy but missed it by a foot. <laughs> <laughs> so the only you, thing you worse than shooting a decoy in. is missing a decoy. <laughs> well, that, then I thought if you had hit the decoy, I would have been mad. <laughs> but you actually missed it. Oh, that's funny. So that caused Zach to drop. Oh, you, why did you not say that in front of? Why I was he? going to, but hey, I couldn't get a word. He started talking about singing the word of God. I, I just thought I can't he do took, it. He to took us man. off. That's his yeah. That was funny. Well, I was. I know it was. Great to have him. It was great to have him on the podcast too. That always is. But what a what an idea too for a couple of guys. They're just like, you know what? We're going we're gonna sing the word of God. Mm-hmm. I mean that that's what they do. Yeah. They 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 sing Bible verses. Well, you them. know, we just had this conversation, remember a couple of podcasts ago before we had Shane on. That's what we do preaching wise. We're just like, we're just gonna preach the word of God. And you think that sounds simple because the Bible says it, preach the word. But a lot of pastors, unfortunately, don't preach the word. They they preach other things, and, and you shouldn't do that. Well, the word of God is living and active. And look, the Bible's about Jesus. I mean, we're, we're going through this, and Jesus is being revealed. But all these scriptures that that keep getting referred to as Jesus being the fulfillment of, that's why we keep saying the Bible is about Jesus. Yeah. And you read, you could take a number of passages, but that Colossians 1, when you just read that chapter talking about who Jesus is, it is the resume of all resumes. Yeah. He's the image of the invisible God. Right. You know, I mean, I always used to do that illustration of, close your eyes and picture God. And most people, I was kind of manipulating them because most people don't see anything because it is based on faith and we didn't see the actual Jesus. Of course, now, since the chosen has become so popular, when you tell someone to close their eyes and picture God, they see that guy, Jonathan, who plays Jesus on the chosen, which is funny. Which, by the way, that that season four comes out February 1st, so we ought to be getting pretty close to this. Yeah. And uh, I've seen the first two episodes, and they are fantastic. Uh, you mentioned the last podcast in our last overtime that what happened to John the Baptist with Herod's son, mm-hmm. and they they tell that story in one of the episodes. Oh wow! It, it's 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 really it's hard to watch to yeah. tell you the truth yeah. uh, because they make it seem real. And you think about John the Baptist. His job was to prepare the way for the Lord, and he did. And so then, you know, what they really captured that the Bible doesn't say a whole lot about, but just imagine what that did to Jesus and the disciples when John the Baptist had his head cut off over some woman who was mad and manipulates the situation and Herod's pride and is like, I'll give you up to half my kingdom. And he's like, What do you want? I want the head of John the Baptist. But, you know, I I don't want to ruin the show for you that you see, but the bottom line was he did his job. He did prepare the way for the Lord. And, you know, part of the ugliness of this earth and this world is that we do die, we are persecuted, and we're right in the middle of that here where Jesus is being made fun of because he wasn't representing some kind of worldly power. Right. His power was way above anything they could even conceive. No, you're exactly right, Jase. And I thought, I mean, you remembered in John while he was even in there was like questioning, I mean, is this do we get this right? <laughs> like remember he sent the word to Jesus before he got killed. So Yeah, man. they do a good job of that. Yeah. And and you gotta remember Every time someone attacks God, they do it usually from this place of, well, why why do these bad things happen? But bad things happen usually revolves around someone dying. Yeah. But in Jesus, death is not a problem. Right. It is not a problem. That's why we're here. And when you think about what Jesus was up against here, as far as worldly powers, which the evil one uses— for his gain and, and because they're 
they're giving this aura that the more money you have, the more swords you have, the more power you have, that's how great you are. Right. And Jesus is disarming that. And, and us as human beings, we bow down to those types of idols. You know, we're thinking to be, to, to have arrived, you have to have a big bank account or to be having, you know, sex with whoever you want to mm-hmm. or be in charge of something, be, be in charge, power. have some kind of leadership on the planet of any sort to be recognized by other people as great. You just think about how many slogans. I mean, I remember Muhammad Ali. I mean, just boxing popped into my head, but you remember he used to go around and say, I'm the greatest. I'm the greatest. I mean, we are obsessed with knowing who's the great, who's the greatest coach, who's the greatest singer. It's all remember that of, list you had that time in the podcast, all the different Kings, the it's king, just a of, mile long. <laughs> There's a king for everything. There's a king for everything. That's why in the book of Matthew, right after Jesus makes his announcement that the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men, they will kill him. And on the third day, he'll be raised from the dead, and the disciples were filled with grief. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of God, they ask. They want to know how do you get to be a big wheel. So every other human wants to know that. He's yeah. I want to be the greatest. Unless you change and become like children, little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. And whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. And he lists verse 6, anyone causes one of little ones. Verse 7, woe to the world that calls people to do what they do. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. Then the last one, and if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. He, it's graphic. Yeah, he, he just picks a little child. He said, be right. like a little, little child. Yeah. Innocent. And the key, the key word there was the humility. I mean, I think the word the, the yep. theological means the practical here is what you were just talking about, Al. We 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 did this on a previous podcast a while back. We talked about the kings of whatever, the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley, the king of funk, Prince, the king of uh, pop, Michael Jackson, the the queen of R and B, Whitney Houston, the queen of Rock, Janis Joplin, the King of Country, Hank Williams. I mean, like you get to the top and you think, you know, you look just pragmatically, practically look at what happens if that is your, if the, if that's your idol, if that's, if that's your vision of the good life, then why is it that those who get there, they all end up medicating themselves to the point, a lot of them to the point of death? You know, all the ones I just mentioned, for example, they died of, of drug overdoses or suicides or thing, or Kurt Cobain, you know, it, it, and you think, man, if it so, I mean, I think the thing that's that's the difference in the in this kingdom that Christ is bringing is that and you just think about your own life. And when you you've had these visions in your own life, I've had them. If I had this amount of money, Max just told me the other day. Just last night, he said, man, if I had, and he described the financial setup, Max is 18 years old, he's about to go to college, and he's describing a fi- his financial setup when he's 40, and he's like, if, I, if I'm there at 40, I'm good. Like, I'm a made man. And I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you think that until you get that and you realize, oh, crap. You know, I've got more bills. I have right. increased my standard of living. I, I, it, it just you don't get there, and and we all know this. Anybody who has achieved any success in their life that you you thought that would be what you needed, and then when you got there, you realize nope, it's still not enough. And that is the peace of mind that I think is coming with the kingdom of of heaven. It is not that kind of kingdom that's built on an inward pull of power and consumption. We're not pulling in things. To, to fill us uh, other than Christ himself. We do consume John six, we consume Christ and that's that we can, as we consume him, we're, we're worshiping him and, and, the, and he's who fills us. And that is the big difference. I think of what's happening here and Jesus's death that is coming. It's not just the death for um, payment for our sin, although it is that 
It's also death to the, to the system, to the earthly kingdoms, to the everything that the whole story of Israel of what they were trying to accomplish, but never could. It's the death to all of that. And then the rebirth of the new creation that Christ is bringing in, in his kingdom work. And, and that's, man, that's truly good news right there. So, Zach, today when uh, you came onto the podcast, there's some kind of issue with your camera, and you have a sort of a smoky, gray, hazy look. And I do. What, what was your first thought when you saw yourself in the monitor? What did What did you think? I thought I, I've got fatty liver disease. I'm, I'm looking at, I mean, yeah, I look like that. Yeah. You know, you get that look when you got liver failure or whatever. I mean, I'm like, I don't look good. I'm, I'm, I'm turning my head from side to side to see if I can get any coloration whatsoever. And, uh, not happy. Um, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna have to fix this in post, as they say. So something something's off. Well, so we could. While it's easy for us to fix your uh, camera in post, not so easy to fix the liver in post because that's that's the problem. Uh, the American yeah. the American Heart Association indicates that adults with fatty liver uh, are three and a half times more likely to have heart failure than those without, and that's why we talked about that gray look. In fact, a hundred million Americans. Uh, deal with fatty liver. And so it puts uh, obviously people at risk. Uh, Everything gets thrown at your liver. And so you don't want a sluggish fatty liver. Uh, It's going to make you gain weight. It's going to make you lose energy. Uh, There are 500 key functions every day that your liver needs. And so we have a product for you. And it's a product that I have taken that helped get my liver enzymes uh, back in line. It's called Liver Health Formula. Uh, It's an all-natural supplement. It uh, contains 11 uh, proven botanicals uh, that can help recharge and protect your liver. So it's very good. If you're looking to ignite your fat-burning metabolism, boost your energy, transform how you feel and look, try Liver Health Formula. You're going to receive a free bottle of blood sugar formula, which helps you reduce the sugar cravings when you order today. So try Liver Health Formula by going to GetLiverHelp.com slash Unashamed to get that free bonus gift. That's GetLiverHelp.com slash Unashamed. I was in the, um, in our last, I think it was in the overtime, we were talking about, that's why, Zach, to what you just described, when you're, when you're watching in our context of Luke 22, there's such a stark contrast and difference in looking at Jesus, who we know is our King and Messiah, watching him in this moment as he's sacrificing himself and doing just what Dad described in that verse by the giving of himself um, and serving all of humanity. You see this stark contrast because you have this angry, um, bitter, you know, power mad group of religious hierarchy that are the ones causing all the uproar, yeah. claiming it's him. Then you've got a shallow, disconnected, um, I don't know what, just, I don't know, frivolous king of Israel, Herod and his group, you know, the, or at least the one of Galilee. And then you've got this guy who really thinks he's in charge, but is trying to think of any way that he can deal with this situation other than killing him because some part of him knows that's not the right thing to do. But in the end, what does he do? He washes his hands as if that uh, absolved him and said, this is on you. It's not on me, but it was on all of them. But you see the contrast of that. Those are all earthly leadership situations versus Jesus who mostly just stands there and says nothing. Yep. Yeah. Well, he told Pilate in John 19, he said, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Right. And uh, yeah, I thought about that Colossians 1, when given Jesus' resume, he's the image of the invisible God, for by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, powers, rulers, or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. Well, when he when Paul's letter gets to chapter 2, it says in verse 13, when you were dead in your sins, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. He canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. 
he took it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers, authorities, and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. And, you know, we immediately go to think, well, because he was resurrected, but even at the cross, he triumphed over them because every vice and every power move that they pulled, he showed them that's not the way for true power and true success. Right. Just by his redeeming nature and humility and sacrifice, the very opposite, what, what they all deemed as weak, he actually conquered the law that stood opposed to us and yeah. any, any, any kind of accusation that you could throw out uh, against someone. And so, but then he, he, he doesn't stop there. He gets to chapter three, so that, and these translators in, in these uh, Bibles have the heading so wrong because you just read that in chapter two where he, he took away the regulations, nailing it to the cross. And then somebody put the headings up here, rules for holy living, rules for Christian household. You know, they missed it because he's saying, you know, like in verse 15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts as members of one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom as you sing hymns, spiritual songs with gratitude. And whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. He, he provided a way for us to be great through him becoming weak yeah. and dying and redeeming and and cleaning us up and nailing that law that stood opposed to us on the cross. I mean it would it was never a path in all the great kingdoms, powers and authorities for greatness and that was actually the way he provided victory for humanity. Yeah. So that we could then become him on earth which is what the original intent was of God creating men and women yeah. to reflect God's glory. And he now provided a way that we could do it. He unshackled us. Right. He took us out from under these powers and authorities and curses and of the law. So it's really a beautiful story about God redeeming mankind to its original order of what it was supposed to be. No, that's good. Yeah. yeah. That's, uh, if you look at um, the, the account of Jesus before the Sanhedrin, we're in Luke 22, but if you look in, in Mark, I mean, I'm sorry, look at Matthew, it, you look at what Jesus said that really kind of set them on fire. I mean, they were already looking for a reason to kill him. And they, in fact, one account says they were looking for false testimony, which we brought up before. But um, in, in Matthew uh, 26, um, let me read this real quick. This is uh, the chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death. So they wanted to put him to death, but they didn't find any. Do what? What verse are you in? I'm in uh, 59 and okay. 60. Uh, but they did not find any, though many false false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, and this is what they, this is what they testified against Jesus. This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. If you remember with this story, it's actually interesting that they twist what happened. What Jesus says is he didn't say what he said. You can destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. Speaking of his body. Um, and so it's interesting to me that th when when you say, what does that even mean? Like, what does that have to do with anything about the temple of God being destroyed and being rebuilt in three days? Well, we know that earlier when he said this, it says he was talking about his body. But I think to look at the whole account of Matthew, from Matthew, the very first part of Matthew, it introduces Christ as Emmanuel, God with us. That's what, that's what it means. Emmanuel, God with us. So God is now with us. God's coming to live with us. In the very end of Matthew, when he gives the Great Commission, he tells them that he will be with them 
to the end of the age. He'll be with them. And, and I, I think that, that if you could like put brackets around the whole like four gospels, I think that one of the biggest messages that Christ is coming to declare in this moment and what he's actually doing is he's providing not just a way for us to go to heaven, but more so for heaven to come to us, for God to come with us, live in us, which when you move into Acts chapter two, you see what, what that means clearly, that the Holy Spirit is going to come. God himself will live in the bodies of believers. That's, I, I don't, I don't understand that, but I mean, that is power. That's, power. That's a power I can't even comprehend. Jay's, you made that point out of Colossians, which I think is so strong because, you know, a lot of times we, we really don't grasp how well timed this all was. Uh, in the last podcast, Zach, you read from Daniel 7. We also know from Daniel 2, this was choreographed to come out under Roman rule for a lot of different reasons, but one even was the way he died. Because you remember in, in John 18, uh, which we read some in the in the last overtime, when he's talking to Pilate in John 18, starting in verse 28, they bring him, and so you know they don't want to even go into the palace because it's Passover, so they don't want to be ceremonially unclean, which is I find fascinating. They're willing to kill this man, but they don't want to be unclean and miss a meal. And so Pilate comes out to them. He says, what charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. And so Pilate says, and this is what you would expect, well, take him yourselves. Judge him by your own law. Why are you bringing him to me? If he's done something wrong, you have the power to deal with it. And here's what they said. But we have no right to execute anyone, which was the rub here. They couldn't kill him. The Jews objected. This happened. And here's the key, Jazz says now, when you read that verse a minute ago, verse 32 this happened so that the words Jesus had spoken indicating the kind of death he was going to die would be fulfilled. Mm. In other words, he came here to die for the sins of the world, but he came here to, to hang on a tree to take on the curse of the world, because this is going all the way back to the Old Testament, the curse of those who hang on a tree. He came to be executed, crucified on a cross, and the only way that would happen was under especially in this era he came under Roman rule to be executed in this certain way, in this suffering way, which is the whole reason that he came. And so I don't think we realize how finally, it's not like this just happened, it's random. This was all laid out and orchestrated by God Almighty before we were even created, that this is the way this was going to go down. And that's exactly the way it happened. Well, yeah, even to that point, I mean, it's like we've made a big deal about the temple and the kingdom, and we said that the temple was designed to be a place where God and humans meet. Right. And heaven and earth meet. Thus, you know, by just association. You know, God. we think of God, he's in heaven, we're here on earth. But if you look at what, in Matthew's account, when when Jesus prayed in Matthew 6. He said, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so a lot of people have trouble digesting that because they're like, well, that must going to come later. And technically that's true because Jesus is praying here at the beginning of his ministry. But when you get to Matthew 28, post-death, burial, and resurrection, he says all authority, which is where we're at, he's battling all the authorities before he dies on a cross, and he triumphant, he is triumphant on the cross and in the resurrection. He then says all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Yeah. And so I think it's interesting then when you say, well, what's that got to do with us? Well, when Paul was writing to the Ephesians, watch how he uses the cross. And I just noticed this the other night. That's why I'm bringing this up. In verse 7 of Ephesians, it says, In Jesus we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So we know where that took place on a cross. Yep. 
in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding, and he made known to us, talking about people who are spirit-filled, to Zach's point, the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached the fulfillment, to your point yep. about the times coming. Right. But what's then this next statement? To bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. And so my point is, this is bigger than just going to heaven. This was about him disarming the powers, triumphing on the cross, being raised from the dead, being ascended to the right hand of God as king of kings over heaven and earth, leaving us the Holy Spirit or sending us the Holy Spirit to then be his representatives on earth, in essence, ruling through us on earth as it is in heaven. And, and granted, the last piece of that puzzle will be those who have trusted in him, those who have the Holy Spirit of God being resurrected like him in this final fulfillment of heaven and earth intersecting yeah. for eternity. No, that's exactly right. And we're seeing this all happen in real time while we're studying it because that's why he kept predicting about the king, the temple being destroyed and everything, and the system, as you mentioned, Zach, would be changed. In fact, he even told Pilate this, back to uh, John 18. So Pilate brings Jesus back in after this back and forth with the religious leaders, and he said, are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied, it was your people, your chief priests, who handed you over to me. What is it you've done? Mm -hmm. He still can't find a reason to kill him. And then here's the here's the kicker, Zach, to everything we've been talking about. My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. He just broadened out the whole concept. And that, notice what he didn't say. He didn't say my kingdom is not in this world. That's he right. He said it's not from this world, which means... He's that's a that's directional language, meaning that if I say, where did you come from? Well, you got to be somewhere to come from somewhere. And so the idea is he's talking about like it's here. I mean, that that is a declaration like the kingdom. This is about the kingdom. And I, I think that's the though. This was a big shift for me in understanding the four Gospels is that the, the primary thing that he's talking about is not the only thing in, that he's talking about, but it's the primary thing is he is talking about his kingdom. That's You see it in the language here, and we miss that, and we focus only on the atonement part of it, which is, that's a means to to the end of what God's trying to accomplish, which is to dwell with his people. But what he's saying is, uh, like, there's there's a kingdom. This is about kingdoms. This is what we're talking yeah. about. And, and, to talking prove, to and to prove your point, so, I mean, the pilot says, well, you're a king then. And Jesus said, you're right in saying I'm a king, and here's to your point, Zach. In fact, for this reason I was born. Now, that's quite a statement. He's not because we know he had a lot of other things he accomplished, as you said. But in this context, he says, I was born for this kingdom and to be a king of it. That's what he says. And then he says, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And he just describes how you get in this kingdom. Yeah. I think that's why people have trouble wrapping their head around this. It's like what I read in Colossians 2. You're like, well, how did he gain victory through a cross? Because we're in this section where he's battling all these authorities and he seemingly loses. That's right. They, they seemingly win because they execute him. Yeah. But when you read Colossians, it says, but he took away the law, the law itself. You know, if you break the law, just man's law, that most of it is based on God's law, just by happenstance. Mm -hmm. Some of it's not, but most of it is. Then they're like, well, we got you. Well, he took away the law itself. It said it, he took it away, the law that stood opposed to us in, in Colossians 2, taking it away by nailing it to the cross. He, he fulfilled it. Well, then he took away 
execution. He executed execution. Because you think, well, that always works in the in the Roman mind, yeah. based on their authority. When you're executed, we win and you lost. But he took away execution itself. Yeah. And ultimately, he took away death itself and will take it away for all of us. So my point is, you're like, well, how do we reign as members of the kingdom on the earth? Because there's no law that they can come up with or no punishment that can be associated with it from an authority standpoint that stands triumphantly against what Jesus disarmed. Right. You're like, well, they may kill you, though. Well, yeah, they killed him also. How'd that go for them against him? Yeah. They're all dead now, and he's alive. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. (laughs) I can be forgiven and guilt-free and have a purpose on earth right now, despite whatever you say. Which is exactly why, Jay's that he, Pilate's answer, or his question and answer to Jesus was the same one people have been asking ever since. Well, what is truth? In other words, if I came here to testify the truth, the reason I was born for this kingdom, well, what is, in other words, what do, how do, how would, how would that work? He can't see anything beyond his Roman structure. He can't even imagine what he's talking about. He can't see that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and you said something, Jason, on previous podcasts. And I love the line. He was only worried about insurrection, but he should have been looking out for resurrection. <laughs> well, exactly. That was a much bigger deal than what he was looking out for, which is only people trying to thwart the power of Rome. Well, it's like I told you about John the Baptist, and you know, depicted in the Chosen, and I was wondering how they would show, I mean, they showed the saw blade coming up. He's being bound, you know, and it's, it's artistic impression what they did. Cause they're like, you know, are these your last words? And he quoted what Jesus said, tell John the Baptist. That was kind of how they got that in there. Yeah. And they're like, Oh, these are your last words. And they're like, so we're, we therefore execute you. And well, when they said that, the reason I came up with that idea about Jesus executed execution is because he kind of had a wry smile and he looked out through a window, speaking of Why wind- you need windows? windows, and there was, he just saw a, a, a lamb out in the field, you know, and he kind of, he kind of grinned and then it cut away. And I mean, you, you know what happened, you know what happened. But the way they depicted his his personality or his mood in that moment was one of victory. You you can't execute me. Yeah. I mean, I know you. It looks like you are, but to you know, to quote my good good friend Shane E, I'm fighting a battle that's already been won. Yeah. And this was yeah. before Jesus died and was buried and resurrected. But they built that. We had a great discussion after we watched that episode. And uh, my friends that were with me, they were like, I don't what? Why was he? Why do you think they had him pictured, picturing a lamb? And I said, well, because in John 2, he said, look, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He had already figured it out that he was preparing the way. How, how did he know that? It, it's a great little statement that's never preached on. Yep. And which is probably where they got the idea to put a lamb on the hill right before he right. was he was executed himself or so-called executed. But that's how we reign on the earth. It, it may look a certain way. It may look like Christians have no power, that they're being run over, that they're outnumbered, that their voice is not making a difference. Oh, but it is. Yeah. And it's like the wind. Spirit-filled people are like the wind, John chapter 3. You're, you're led by the Spirit, and you have this hope, and you have this purpose here on the earth that God designed in the beginning of time. That Ephesians 1 says he determined beforehand that we would be chosen. He knew. And and he yeah. said he said in that context, just like you can't explain where the wind starts and where it ends, you're not be able to explain how the spirit works, and and what it and how it all functions. 
and we don't. I mean, we know he's there, but we don't know all the all those answers. And to, and to your point, Jace, on the on the death of Christ, and almost his attitude towards it, we can read Paul. You know, you read the Pauline account of of the death of Christ in First Corinthians fifteen, and Paul is taunting death. I mean, he's almost, it's a mockery. It's, it's where, oh, death is your sting. Where, uh, where, oh, death is your victory. And you say, man, who would, ta- who could truly taunt death? And it could only be the one who's not bound by death. And that's why death was the final enemy to be defeated. And so what Christ is doing there, I mean, he, it, it is a, it is a victory, but it's a, vi- it's a victory through suffering and it's ultimately conquering a suffering. And so when we think, you know, that's one of the reasons why when we don't want to get in this podcast, we don't want to get into doomsday prophecies because the world, you can say, oh, the world is going to hell in a handbasket. And man, things are getting worse and worse and worse. And we're, the church is in peril and all. And it's, 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 it's a very negative view of, of the kingdom. And we just don't believe that. I mean, we believe that you're not going to shut down the kingdom of God. Well, that's a promise in Scripture. It's a promise in, in Daniel 7. It's a promise that we belong to a kingdom, the, the prophet Daniel says, that can't be shaken nor destroyed. This kingdom that we're a part of, that Jesus brought, like we're, you're not going to break it. It's just, I mean, it, that's, that is the fact. And so that's why I think this message is so powerful. One of the reasons is that we don't have to carry around this anxiety that somehow us, this unashamed podcast, your church, your pastor, somehow we got to figure out a way to make sure that we that we don't break the kingdom and that we protect it from getting destroyed. That's not going to happen. It's not our responsibility to maintain it. It's just our privilege to be in it and to participate in it. And that, that that's a lot of freedom. That's a lot of freedom for, for me to not have to carry the weight of sustaining God's kingdom. None of us have to carry that weight. None of us. Uh, I want to read this last section that gets us up to the point of the crucifixion because we left off with this last time just to kind of fill in the blanks because we talked a lot about the conversation with Pilate. So in Luke 23, verse 13, here's here's up to that point because, you know, Herod, he's handing him off to Herod. Herod sent him back. And so in verse 13, Pilate calls together all the chief priests, the rulers and the people, and he said to them, you brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. So there's the insurrection, day. I've examined him in your presence and I found no basis for your charges against him. I mean, this is a slam. I mean, he just slams these guys. Neither has Herod, for he has sent him back to us. As you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. What a statement. I mean, I mean, that backs up all the privacy that he never said. I mean, he's done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. And when Jace, you talked about that, he, you know, mm-hmm. that was the brutal cat of nine tails and you know everything he did to him. With vo- one voice, they cried out, away with this man. Release Barabbas to us. Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. And we know it was the custom that we talked about that someone could be released. They're crying for an actual insurrection. Verse 20, wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again. But they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. For the third time he spoke to them, why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and then release him. So he's just like keeping, he's thinking he's going to convince him. And now it's creating an insurrection. Loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified, and their shouts prevailed, and it always does against political types. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for, and surrendered Jesus, and this is a big phrase to me, to their will. So you remember Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done. Pilate mm-hmm. submits him to the will of the people, which is to crucify him for something he did not deserve. But he came to give his life for us. So that sets up what's actually going to happen in the crucifixion. But, you know, I just, I, I find it fascinating that Pilate is such an advocate for not killing Jesus when he's not a believer. He can't quite figure it out, but he also has no real answer 
for who Jesus is. That's why I want to read that out of John 18 that we've talked about before, because I think he's fascinated by what he's talking about, but he just can't, he can't see it. He can't see past his own power. Well, it's, funny, it's kind of funny because sometimes we'll talk and, you, and the, the way it ends, you interpret it as an invitation, and right. sometimes you don't. Yeah, it's time to sing a song. That way. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a difficult read, you know, knowing this was the plan that had to happen to rescue mankind. It I mean, is, the, and it's difficult know. to read it as it's happening because even though we know what happens, it seems so defeating in the moment. I think that's the hard part. You've said it several times. Mm-hmm. It's now really, man it's dragged, a bittersweet. One man dragged to the a cross and butchered like they did. It just, after you you read about him, he was worth every bit of it. Yeah, he was. But that was a, a mighty tough decision. I mean, it would have been for me. How about you? Well, now do you know why he was sweating drops of blood <laughs> you know, the night before he had to go through all this? I'm telling you, man. I mean, even well, Jesus knew, right? Well, we always look at it like you just think about what causes pain. This is a slaughter. What causes pain and agony. You know, if you lose a friend in death, you're upset. Whether he was executed or just died in a car wreck. Now, you lose a family member, it. it it's ratcheted up. You're, yep. You lose your wife. Well, it's about the worst thing that can happen to you. I mean, you're, but you think about from Jesus's perspective, I mean, he's had an eternal relationship and this is, this is the plan based on the love of God that he's going to come down and be killed by the very creatures that he created I mean that that that's just I'm not sure where that falls into dealing with a loss in the moment. Yeah. I mean even though he's an eternal being to step inside time and allow that to happen the, it's just there's humility then there's that. Yeah. I mean it's hard for us to wrap our head around it is what I'm getting at. And when you think why he did it well as individuals it's just moving to think, yeah, he died for the world, but somehow or another we separate the power of it when you look at it that way. When you think your, of your contribution from a sinful standpoint and just a, being an idiot standpoint, it, it, it's, this is why, you know, when Jesus said that famous statement, when I'm lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. Uh, and I think it's the nature of it was done in humility. It was done based on his character and his heart for all people, yeah. no matter race, no matter condition, no matter wealth. It, it, it's just there's nothing like it in the world. There's there's not a better offer in the world. There's never been a another movement that even it's the only thing it. that says death is not a problem for you. Yeah. yeah. That's not a problem for you. Yeah. Just Abraham, Moses, he mentions them. They're, they're not dead. They're alive. And just like we're reading in this story, the people that don't know and understand what this means have a hard time wrapping their heads around it. You know, there's been a, a little bit of controversy this last couple of weeks over during the NFL playoffs. One of the, the quarterback for the Texans, who's a believer, Every time they interview him after a big win, and everybody loves the story, but he starts out by not just praise, you know, thank God, he praises Jesus Christ. He says his name. He says, He's my Lord and Savior. I want to start there because without him, I'd have. And so now they cut it out. Yeah. yeah they cut that part out whenever he, re- they're live, they couldn't cut it. But when they replayed it, they cut that part out. And, you say, and it made a lot of people upset. And so you're like, well, why would they do that? Because they don't know what he knows and what we know. That's right. And so they're like, why does he keep saying that? We're just going to cut that part out. We All we want to do is hear about football. But what they don't understand is this man knows what Christ did for him. And so he's like, I, I'm, I'm going to talk about it. And if, I'm, if you're going to ask me a question, I'm going to begin there. Yep. And why I admire the young man's courage, I mean, he's 24 years old. And he's like, no, I want people to know who I submit to. But see, we get that. I get that. I, when I see this, I get oh, it. Yeah. And but a lot of like the people that are this network, they're like, oh, why does he keep doing that? They don't understand it. 
Win or lose, he's already won. He's already won. <laughs> and he's like, football's great, but you know what? Uh, I'm into something way bigger. And so I just I admire people like that because he has a huge platform and he's using it. And a lot of people that bothers. Oh, why does he want to talk about that? You know, keep that. Talk about that at church. We don't want to hear yeah, that. Keep that to yourself. Keep that to yourself. But he he gets it. He understands what we're talking about here. Mm-hmm. That this is way bigger than ourselves. Which of course was Jesus' whole point about the kingdom. It's bigger. It's bigger than power. It's bigger than what you think is who you think is in charge. So we've obviously made the right call. Uh, we're out of time. I want to. Uh, I do before we go. I want to. Uh, I remind you about Dad's book, uh, which is going to release on March the 12th in about six weeks. Uh, it's called, I Could Be Wrong, But I Doubt It, Why Jesus is Your Greatest Hope on Earth and in Eternity, which, of course, is what we've been talking about. You can go to a website, I Could Be Wrong, But I Doubt It, dot com, to get a sneak peek of the book. You get to read, I think the first chapter is on there. Um, so it'll kind of give you a sense of it. And we'd love for you to pre-order the book because that helps us sell a lot more books when it comes out. So check it out. Uh, I could be wrong, but I doubt it. And we'll see you next time on Unashamed. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube. And be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.